Hi there, and welcome to Night Church. My name's Rod. Tonight, we're going to ask the question, who is God? Who is God? Well, that's a great question. Unfortunately, it is one that seems to have too many answers. Some close, some not so close, some just way off. You could ask this question to 100 people, inside or outside of the church, and still get 100 slightly or completely different answers. Let's keep in mind this is a huge topic. So this will be more like knowing God 101. I'll do my best to lay a foundation that should you choose, you may build upon that. I'm open and excited to respond to questions online. Using the word respond, not answer, seems a little more fair because one question may lead to many and of course I don't have all the answers. So let's begin this little journey of ours by clearing up a few things. My purpose here is not to convince you of my supreme correctness. Just to give you the opportunity to perhaps see the God I love, well, in a different light than he often gets painted in. First things first. Who is God not? Well, he's not this mean old angry judge. He's certainly not a cosmic vending machine. You all know about that one, let's just make a wish, and yeah. Or some guy waiting on a mountaintop for you to screw up so he can zap you. It's just to mention a few. I'm sure you've heard more that before you were Christians, you said more. We live in a world for all intent and purposes that hates or rejects God. And there are many reasons for this. To name a few, one, for example, the church hurt people. I know we can all add to that. Two, we love our bad behavior. We Christians use that little word, sin. It covers a lot of ground for three little letters. Three, he just doesn't want us to have any fun. It's just to name a few. There's lots of reasons. Without getting into the spiritual side of things, we could go on for months discussing this. But that is part of the problem. When approached with the prospect of God and church, we can always continue to list all of the things he is not. But we attach those attributes to him so we can feel justified for rejecting or hating him. So keep in mind, this is normal. We all do it. I was literally doing it the, that very moment I surrendered to him. So relax, you're in good company. At least if that's what you do. Part of my purpose here is to help us see past those things and to look to who God really is, or at least to help start that journey, if you want to. There's free will and all that. Now, have you ever done something that was well perceived as dumb or mean or just bad? Even though that thing may not have been, but you know, you had a choice that had to be made and you chose the lesser of two evils, whatever that may have been. Now, the people who don't truly, honestly know you judge you based on that one thing without knowing why. Whys are super important, and I may rabbit trail in a little bit about them. Okay, so now a bunch of folks who barely know you are judging your entire existence based on one moment in time, and that wasn't even what they think it is. I'm sure most of you see where I'm going with this, but it's all about context. So let's go into detail with an example from the Bible where this can happen. I chose an example that bugged me early in my life, which I later found myself defending God over, so it's a bit of a turnaround, and that's God is a jealous God. Isn't jealousy bad? Wouldn't it be considered a sin? This depends on context. The Bible refers to God as a jealous God. Keep in mind, these are his words, spoken through the prophets and the apostles, nevertheless, God's words. So what does he say? Well, Deuteronomy 4.24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. That's Exodus 34, 14. Keep in mind, he describes himself with many names. 
He's pretty big and really complex, so these are actually there to help us understand him better. So, we hear this term in scripture a few times now, and I've had those friends and others toss this at me. If he's so powerful, why does he have to be jealous? Or, why is God so insecure that he gets jealous? Etc., etc., etc. For starters, in these examples, these folks recently came out of a land with like a million false gods and handfuls of idols and such. They would worship just about anything and do some crazy nasty things in the process of that worship. The God, the God of the Bible, wants what is best for us. Sometimes we don't get it, often until like 30 years later in my case. The things of the world that hold our attention often take us away from what is really good. Anyone ever become a sports widow or widower, for example? So the purpose here is if we love him, we put him first and we generally tend to have a much better sense of priorities in life. And we of course love our family better, etc. For the record, things and activities and sports that clearly aren't bad you don't have to become a monk for him, which is often what we think, um, based on all the wrong info again. But we do tend to do what equates to worshiping things. Money, sex, popularity, our kids, whatever it may be. The list can be very long, and we're super crazy at making things idols. It may sound weird, but yeah, we end up worshiping stuff. So back to my situation here. So the jealous thing threw me at first when I read it. All those things ran through my head. I asked some questions and was pretty satisfied when I heard it explained sort of like this. So you're out for dinner. You see your brother having a romantic dinner with some hoochie mama, not his wife. A million things run through your head because like my wife, his wife is pretty cool and you like her, she's like an awesome person. So you go and ask, dude, what's the deal? Why are you romancing someone else? Don't you love your wife? His response in a matter of fact type way, you know, the why are you even asking me this question kind of response. He looks at you and says, it's Thursday and goes back to eating and spooning. So you're like, what in the world is that supposed to mean, man? He looks back at you and calmly says, well, I love my wife Friday to Wednesday and love this one Thursdays. Okay, I don't know about you, but I would have to sleep with one eye open. Never mind sleeping with one eye open. I'd be sleeping in the tool shed, hiding. So God is not a jealous God out of insecurity. He knows how easily we can trade his plan and his purpose for us his love for us for a moment of pleasure or whatever. We trade perfect love and affection for a moment in time that leaves us empty or for a quest to amass extreme wealth or popularity or whatever. Am I making a little sense here? So he is jealous because he desires for us to love him back. Yes, I said back because he loves us and I can't say it enough. He wants what's best for us. His jealousy is, not, is one of not wanting to share us with the things that wreck us or steal our affection. Unfortunately, our list and his list are often very different. Fortunately, along with jealous attribute, there is grace and mercy and patience from God anyways. So that is my very long-winded way of saying context is super important. We often read and react instead of read and investigate. If we don't know God, we can't really judge him fairly by a single act or a single line in his book out of context. That was a big one for me, but understanding his desire for us and our natural way of drifting into less than good things may get a lot more sense. Um, perhaps you have one of those, hmm, what does that mean moments? 
we all have had many. So, who is God? Let's have a new discussion about a very old topic. So old, in fact, that no one is really sure how old, except God. We try and we get it wrong, but that's sort of our problem at times. We focus on things like that. The hows. Don't get me wrong, the same attitude is in the church as well as outside the church. We spend so much time on, like, the how questions, we don't bother embracing the whys. How questions are good, but they only speak to the act. Why questions give us way more insight because they look at the intent, which gives us context, therefore better understanding. Let's look at this with some more lists. How old is the universe? How did we come into existence? Too many theories there. How can we be the only intelligent life in the universe? Well, some of us anyways. Just to mention a few. Don't get me wrong, how questions are great. The philosopher asks how, the scientists investigate, and a bunch of times they get it right. So that's cool. But before I move on to the whys, let's hear some church hows. How can you believe that really happened? God doesn't work like that. How could he say I was gossiping and it's sinful? I saw him coming out of the liquor store the other day, you know. How can she come to church dressed like that with all those tattoos and piercings? I suppose I should stare a lot so she knows she doesn't belong here. Sometimes our how questions can lead to hurtful and destructive behavior. Okay, to be fair, my list was a little harder on the church. You've heard judge not, lest he be judged. Yeah, that part of scripture actually tells us how to judge one another. The problem we run into here is it's for Christians to judge each other rightly and not for everyone in the world who doesn't believe in God. We do a pretty poor job of it a lot of the time. Not necessarily with malice or bad intent, but you know, sometimes, yeah. Now that I beat up the world and the church, let's move this train. We will get into the whys in a second. Question time. Earlier I mentioned about being judged for a single moment in time without any context. Have you ever done something that was more kind of dumb, made a bad choice, and it turned out horrible? But you had the best of intentions? Okay, so did people remember why you did it, or just that you did it and kind of labeled you for it? Your close friends defend you, but those other folks, well, have already made up their minds about you. Um, you're the one that did that thing. How could you? There it is again. How? Nasty little word keeps popping up, and it's usually rhetorical because they've already made up their minds. In your head, you're saying to yourself, if they only knew why. Oh, why? Now, you go for like a job interview, who do you want telling your story? The person who knows you well and defended you when you did the stupid thing, or the person that barely knows you and judges your entire personality by one act in one moment of time. It's a pretty easy guess. The person that truly knows you, I'm assuming. So, when you want to know about God, where do you go? Let's face it. So often we go to the answers and stories we like and create a God we can get behind. Or we go to the stories that paint him as that angry, mean, lightning bolt throwing old man so we can justify rejecting him. I'm not picking on anyone here. I did it myself for years. I formulated my opinion of God based on baseless claims and my own frustrations with him, which were actually frustrations with myself I later discovered when I quit being mad at him for my own foolishness. So basically, I spent a lot of time getting to know God from people who didn't know him, but they agreed with me, so that was cool. It was good enough for me. Why do we do it? Couldn't tell you. Well, I, I could. At this point, you wouldn't believe me, so we'll leave that for later on in the year. You want to know God? Easy stuff. Well, not easy, but you kind of get where I'm going. So he wrote a book, you may have heard of it, it's called the Bible, 
number one bestseller for like centuries. He also has quite a few people who, wait for it, actually know him. Surprising, I know. I mean, nobody can truly know every aspect of God. That's like a total head exploding moment. But we can know him better than we do. Why, you ask? Ah, uh, yes, the whys. Well, for starters, he actually wants to know you better. I mean, he knows you. He wants to know you. You know, be a part of your life. And I know, and you know, that I know, that you know, I'm using the word know a lot. And the English language is annoyingly tricky with some words like that one. That is the reason context is so important. So here's one of those rabbit trails I warned you about. Stay with me for a second. I know a lady at 7-Eleven. She sells me Slurpees and chocolate bars, fair enough. We chat, exchange weather, comments, etc. But I know my wife, what she likes, what she doesn't like, favorite foods, what makes her happy, what makes her sad, etc. It's a deep, involved relationship to know someone. That's the know God wants, and it's two-way. So who is God? To be fair, he exists in three parts. One person, three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. You may have heard both. Depends on your translation. Both are correct. For tonight's purpose, I'm referring to God the Father. After all, he's a loving father. He is the model of what a loving father is. He is our model, an example. Obviously, he's infinitely better at it than we are. However, he doesn't hold that against us. You see, as a loving father, he does focus on the best parts of us and wants, us to, encourage, uh, wants to encourage us to grow in those things and, of course, shed the bad stuff. Why? There it is again. Context moment. Because he created us in his image, his spiritual image. He wants what's best for us. The problem we run into is our best and his best don't always look the same, as I mentioned before. But isn't that often how we roll? Look at our own lives. <clears throat> Dads, moms, do you want the best for your kids? Do you want them, do you have the same concept of what is best? I think not. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> you have more experience and you've seen more life. You can offer a bigger picture of what things look like than what your child can who has less knowledge and less experience. But, and it's a big but, do you love them any less when they screw up? Most of the time, you love them deeper because you feel the pain they feel. God does the same for us. Why? Because he sees the entire picture, the whole thing. He painted it after all. I sincerely hope I'm making a little bit of sense here and not just rambling like a madman. Okay, so I alluded to, what I alluded to earlier was his love for us is what motivates him to act in our lives. But his love for us is also what causes God to let us make our own choices, even the bad ones. He actually wants us to learn and grow. God does not want anyone to suffer. He wants all of us to spend eternity with him. His angelic construction crew right now is making mansions as we speak. Remember, this little, little bit of time here is only the beginning. To make my point, here's a little something that you can't go to a football game without seeing at least once. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16, quite possibly the most used verse in the Bible. But why did he send his son, an actual part of himself? Well, next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3.17. Pretty cool. We screwed up things thousands of years earlier. And even then, he let us know, I will provide a way out of this mess for you guys. That's right. We made the mess. Our loving Father is cleaning it up. 
we just have to look around us and see what a mess we have made. We can't blame him. I mean, he asked us, he commanded us, he told us. Finally, he said, I knew this day was coming before all of this. He does have foreknowledge of everything after all. I'm sending in the ringer, my son, whom I love, but you guys need him. And as a loving father, I must do this no matter how much it pains me. So why hell if he loves us then? That one ends up being our choice. He didn't make it for us in the first place. We literally chose that by rejecting him. He tells us, don't put your hand to the flame, but far too many of us do it. Now, I know him, not as well as many, but better than others. And I can assure you, every soul that rejects him to the end of their time here, he weeps for because he wants so much more for every one of us. He is still a judge as one of his many attributes. As I said earlier, he's not an angry judge. However, he is a judge. And the, the best one you can really get, he's totally impartial, always right, and he's a just judge. He can only be bought off by one thing and one thing only. We'll get to that in a second. So, at the end of the day, he created everything, loves everyone, wants what is best for everyone, and wants to reconcile with everyone. Not everyone has the same idea or wants what he has to offer. I get that. I lived in that place. It always tore me up, you know, inside fighting to not have to become something I don't want to in order to make him happy. Well, the honest truth is, in our, our own strength, we can't make him happy enough at least to accept us. We can, however, buy him off. The one thing that can do that is the blood of Christ. It pays for our sins, it covers any penalty we have with him, and it opens the door to a relationship with God. And in eternity, much better than the one we deserve. I know some of this is hard to hear, but we are like dripping with sin, that little word with so much meaning. Watch the news, people hating, killing, taking advantage of other people. We do that, not him. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, just to clarify, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. That's Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. So yes, he does judge, but it is our wickedness. And if there's one thing God cannot be around, it is what we call sin. It pains him to see it and be around it. There is some wicked, awesome good news, though. By the way, the word gospel essentially means good news. He did that. The good news is, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. Great book. Just to review, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, equally as important, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3, 16 and 17. So, he sent Jesus so that he could give us freedom from the things that wreck us. It doesn't sound like an angry judge to me. So, in closing, I urge you to give him a chance. Strip away what you think you know and look into his book with a new set of eyes. While you're at it, ask him to make things clear to you. He will. After all, he did it for me and I totally did not deserve his grace. But I finally decided to let God be the judge of that. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and we'll see you next week.